Greetings, friends and brethren from around the world. Uh, I realize that many people, both nominal Christians or biblical Christians or true Christians or any kind of Christians, are very much ignorant about the origin of their customs and the origin of various celebrations that are popular in the Christian world. One such celebration is indeed Easter. Well, we can now say uh, the question might be, what is the, why am I bringing this issue up? Well, because, you know, the word Easter does not even appear in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible do we find, even in the New Testament, both Jesus Christ and the Apostles keeping Easter. Easter, by its very name, Ashtarot, or Easter, is actually pagan goddess of fertility. Pagan goddess that is present in various pagan uh, traditions and pagan nations, from Semiramis of the ancient uh, Babylon to uh, modern-day statues of Mary and so on. So the question is, actually, who imposed Easter onto the Christian world? You know, because uh, this tradition, even the Catholic Encyclopedia would tell you, was not really uh, a Christian tradition, meaning Christian tradition in the first uh, centuries of the Christian world. So that means that the church, the Christian church in the first and the second centuries, did not really observe Easter. Uh, the Easter became custom first in the Rome, in Roman, in the Roman church, and then later in Alexandria. But however, for a long, long time, there were Christians in Asia Minor and other parts of the world who faithfully observed the Passover. Anyway, uh, the question is, so how and when was the Passover changed and by who? So who is the one who changed the, who, who changed the Passover and instituted Easter? Well, I'm, I'm going to read to you a copy of the letter that the Roman Emperor Constantine sent out to all the inhabitants of the Roman Empire that he was king over. Now, you may know that uh, King, that the Emperor, that is Constantine, is regarded as the first Roman Christian Emperor. Well, nothing can be farther from the truth, because Emperor Constantine was born in my country, in Serbia, in the city of Nis, or Nisus, as it is Celtic, as Celtic, its Celtic name is, and it was Constantine, really, who actually tried to unify its own emper empire by combining the religion, uh, the combining the true uh, biblical Christianity with various pagan elements. He made amalgamation, and in order to stop these uh, divisions, religious division within his empire, he basically unified pagans with Christians, and invented his own version of Christianity. Now, many people are not aware of that. Many people are simply not aware of that, and they just, uh, as time goes on, it seems that the uh, level of ignorance on the part of people, as far as their customs are concerned, is greater, ever greater, and ever more blinding. Uh, one of the one of the things that I've noticed myself is the uh, various editions of Encyclopedia Britannica one of the greatest authorities in the world. Well, if you take a look at, for example, some much earlier editions of Britannica, you'll find uh, an honest admission that Easter was not uh, a Christian custom, that Christmas was not a Christian custom, and you will find all kinds of information about uh, who uh, and why uh, imposed such customs onto the Christian world. However, in these, the latest uh, edition of Encyclopedia Britannica, all of those information are dropped and you will find not one uh, sensible, logical and truthful statement about the origin of various Christian customs. So the uh, Roman Emperor Constantine in this letter, well, he named his reasons to change the Lord's Passover. Now, keep in mind, this is Lord's Passover, to a different day, and he also gave it a different name. It was no longer called the Passover, it was called Easter. Now, Constantine was a rabid anti-Semite, 
and he accused the Jews of being a detestable crowd and uh, being so blinded to the killer, the murderers of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. All of those um, traditional accusations which are basically completely unbiblical. Well, first of all, if Jesus Christ did not die, then we would have no sacrifice for our sins and we would all die in our sins, number one. And number two, it was prophesied clearly in the Old Testament that his own people would have to kill him, that they would not accept him and that they would reject him. His own people. He was a Jew by birth. And therefore, he had to be rejected by the Jews. If he was born as an American, as a Serbian, as a Russian, as Ukrainian, as a Georgian, as if he was born as Californian or British, English, Scottish, whatever nationality you want to take, that nationality would have to kill him because that was prophesied in the Bible and God does not lie. On the other hand, it's not only the Jews who killed him, it was the Jews with the help of the Roman authorities. They were, at that time, under the occupation of the Roman Empire, so the Jewish leaders were not authorized themselves to take his life. So, with the help of the Roman authorities, that's what they had done. Yes, they've taken, they've played a significant role in pressuring the Roman authorities to, to kill him, that's true. But again, the prophecy has to be fulfilled. How in the world is this Christian world so uh, 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 illogical today? God does not lie. He is not a human, he does not lie. And therefore, if since he does not lie... The prophecy which he gave us to us through the prophets said that his own people, Jesus Christ's own people, and he was a Jew, had to kill him. And when God says something, it has to happen that way. So, since he was a Jew, that was his people, his people rejected him and they killed him. Yes, exactly, but it had to happen. It had to happen according to Isaiah 53, because it was by his stripes we are healed. It was so that we would be healed mentally, spiritually, emotionally, physically, and so on. So therefore, there is a total uh, illogical anti-Semitism, even employed by the Constantine Emperor, who was supposedly the first Roman Emperor. So he was the one who wanted to detach the Christianity or the nominal Christianity from anything and everything Jewish. And, you know, the net effect of, uh, the net effect was the taking of a pagan day of worship and calling it a holy day given to Christians by God. Well, this is a lie that was foretold by God through Daniel when he said that the fourth beast would think to change times and laws. And the fourth beast in Daniel chapter 7 verse 23 to 25 is actually the Roman Empire. So here is the su supposed first Roman emperor who changed the times and laws. Now, on keeping of Easter, the first council of Nicaea of 325. Well, this is from the letter of the emperor to all those not present at the council. So he sent it, and this is uh, found in Eusebius Vita Constantinus. Uh, it's uh, book number three, pages 18 through 20. And I'm quoting that letter. Here is what the supposed first Christian emperor who is supposed to, who is supposed to be yielded to God's word. This is what he sent to all those who did not attend the Council of Nicaea of 325. It's counted to be the first um, ecumenical council in the world. Here it is, quote, When the question relative to the sacred festival of Easter arose, it was universally thought that it would be convenient that all should keep the feast on one day. For what could be more beautiful and more desirable than to see this festival through which we receive the hope of immortality celebrated by all with one accord and in the same manner? It was declared to be particularly unworthy for this, the holiest of all festivals, to follow the customs or the calculations of the Jews who had soiled their hands with the most fearful of crimes and whose minds were blinded in rejecting their custom. You see, that's the point. Rejecting their custom. Well, not all the customs of the Jews are unbiblical, by the way. And the Passover was given, even in the Old Testament, Jesus Christ, prior to his death, changed only the symbols of the, Pas of the Passover. Meaning that no longer the lamb had to be slaughtered and uh, the, the, there was no longer necessary to um, uh, sign the doorpost or mark the doorpost with the, the lamb's blood. He said to his 
to his disciples, if you read the New Testament, at his last Passover, he said to his disciples, this is my body, this unleavened bread is the symbol of my body that is given for many, and he gave them a uh, uh, wine, a cup of wine, saying, this is my blood shed for the remission of sins for many. So therefore, you know, he just changed the symbolisms, but not the day. He did not change the day, and he did not change the manner of observance of the Passover. And it was always observed on the 14th day of the first month of the, of, of the sacred calendar, which was the month of Abib. And that month of Abib always falls in the spring. That will be March or April. So, continuing with this letter, in rejecting their custom, we may transmit to our descendants the legitimate mode of celebrating Easter, which we have observed from the time of the Savior's passion to the present day, according to the day of the week. Well, continuing in the letter, we ought not, therefore, to have anything in common with the Jews, for the Savior has shown us another way. Our worship follows a more legitimate and more convenient course, the order of the days of the week, and consequently, in, you know, uh, in unanimously adopting this mode, we desire, dearest brethren, to separate ourselves from the detestable company of the Jews. For it is truly shameful for us to hear them boast that without their di di uh, direction we could not keep this feast. How can they be in the right? They who, after the death of the Savior, have no longer been led by reason, but by wild violence, as their delusion may urge them. I mean, all of these stupid accusations have no uh, uh, ground in the reality. And then he continues, of course, in this uh, ludicrous letter. He says, um, they, meaning the Jews, of course, they do not possess the truth in the Easter question. For in their blindness and repugnance to all improvements, they frequently celebrate two Passovers in the same year. Well, this is not true. It was the provision in the Old Testament, if somebody due to illnesses or being far away or due to any kind of... Uh, disablement, if you wish, was unable to keep the Passover on the 14th, there was this provision that a month later he could keep it, and that practice was called the second Passover. So it was only for those who were unable to keep the Passover on its proper season, on its proper day. So this accusation is another false accusation against the Jewish people. And then Constantine continues, listen to this, we could not imitate those who are openly in error, in which error, I'm asking you? I'm asking you, friends, which error? Well, you know, if there are those who keep pagan festival not found in the New Testament, then what is the error of the Bible? Is there an error about the Passover? No, there is not. How then could we follow, he continues, these Jews who are most certainly blinded by error? Well, we are not following the Jews at all. The Jewish people today keep the Seder Supper, which means they keep the, the uh, they keep it as the Passover, they call it the Passover, but it's not the Passover, it's the day, the first day of unleavened bread when uh, when Israelites left Egypt. The Passover comes the previous night, on the night when Jesus Christ was arrested and questioned and, and tormented, and then the following day he was crucified. So we are not following the Jews at all, or at least not us who follow the, the uh, instructions of the Bible. So, but you see what he says, how can we follow? Of course, he's alluding to many people from in Asia Minor who are led by Polycrat and later by Polycrates, and those people remained faithful to the original Passover and kept it on the 14th. But anyway, for, for to celebrate the Passover twice in one year is totally inadmissible. Again, he's making a false accusation that Jews are nobodies. Nobody keeps the Passover twice. But even if this were not so, he continues, it would still be your duty not to tarnish your soul by communications with such wicked people. Besides, consider well that in such an important matter and on a subject of such great solemnity, there ought not to be any division. Our Savior has left us only one festival day of our redemption, that is to say, of His Holy Passion, and He desires to establish only one Catholic Church. Well, even the Catholic Church doesn't keep the Passover, by the way, but Roman, uh, Roman Emperor Constantine was nominally a Catholic. Then he continues in this letter, Think then how unseemly it is that on the same day 
some should be fasting whilst others are seated at a banquet, and that after Easter some should be rejoicing at feasts while others are still observing a strict fast. I have no idea what he's alluding to, to because uh, there is no instruction, no commandment whatsoever in the Bible that the Passover is to be kept with previous fast. There is no such instruction at all. Anyway, he continues, For this reason, a divine providence wills that this custom should be rectified and regulated in a uniform way. Oh, there we are, uniform way. So let's impose to all the world a uniform way, which is wrong, completely wrong anyway, a uniform paganism let's impose on the whole the world so that they would not have anything to do with the detestable company of the Jews, you know. How anti-Semitic, how sad, how terrible. And everyone, I hope, will agree upon this point. Well, he hoped that his hope was in vain. Not everybody agreed upon his point, this point. Because there were they were at that time there were still Christians who observed the Passover, not the Easter, Passover on the fourteenth of Abib. Even to this day, thankfully around the world there are Christians who still also don't agree with him and they just uh, observe, continue to observe what Jesus Christ instituted in the New Testament. On the same day when the, the Old Testament Passover was kept, he instituted the new symbols, the unleavened bread and wine. Then he continues, as on the one hand, it is our duty not to have anything in common with the murders of our Lord. Well, if we take that reason, that we are not to have anything in common with Romans either, because Romans are the ones who allowed the execution of Jesus Christ. And Romans have changed all so many things in the original Christianity and adapted it to their pagan ways and pagan customs. Constantine continues, and as on the other, the custom now followed by the churches of the west, of the south, and of the north, and by some of those of the east. You see, some of those of the east, because in the east, in Asia Minor, the custom was to continue to observe what Jesus Christ commanded. To keep the Passover, the New Testament Passover, with the new symbols on the 14th of Abib. So that's why he says only some, you know, of those in the east. So custom not followed by some of those is, is the most acceptable. It has appeared good to all. So it has appeared good to all at the Council of Nicaea to paganize Passover and institute Christ, uh, Easter. And I have been guaranteed for your consent that you would accept it with joy as it is followed at Rome, indeed, in Africa, in all Italy, Egypt, Spain, Gaul, Britain, Libya, in all Acacia, or Achaia, uh, Achaia, Achaia, that is, and in the Diocese of Asia, of Pontus and Kilikia. Well, you see, he is a guarantee. Who is he? Who in the world is he? He was not even baptized at this time. Till the end of his life, he held on to his title, Pontifex Maximus, the pagan title, the head of the pagan religion. Who in the world is he? He gives guarantee. He is just a secular ruler. He has no... A theological connection whatsoever. Then he continues, listen to this, you should consider not only that the number of churches in these provinces make a majority, but also that it is right to demand what our reason approves, and that we should have nothing in common with the Jews. Here he just repeats, reiterates exactly what he said earlier. So the whole point is, not let's see what is the will of God in the Holy Scriptures, how we should observe the Passover, no, the whole point is, let us have nothing in common with the Jews. Let's not call our feast even the Passover because it does sound Jewish. Let us just, you know, change the name and change the nature. Let's celebrate the rising of the sun, the rebirth of the sun. Let's call it Easter. Now, here it is again. He continues to sum up in few words. By the unanimous judgment of all. It has been decided that the most holy festival of Easter should be everywhere celebrated on one and the same day. And it is not seemly that in so holy a thing there should be any division. As this is the state of the case, accept joyfully the divine favor and this truly divine command. For all which takes place in assemblies of the bishops ought to be regarded as proceedings from the will of God. Oh, certainly not. If the will of God, the will of God has been proceeding to us from Jesus Christ, whom he sent. 
Jesus Christ who said that he is the bread of life. Jesus Christ who just prior to his death at his last Passover service which he kept with his disciples changed the symbols of the Passover and nothing else. Of course he changed the symbols because there was no no longer there will be necessary to kill the lamb because he was the lamb our Passover to be killed for us, sacrificed for us. And there was no need anymore to, you know, uh, mark the bo- doorposts with, with blood because he was the wine, the symbol of his shed blood for the remission of sins. So, so you know, any council of bishops, any assemblies of bishops cannot have greater and higher authority than Jesus Christ himself. And then Constantine now, in his, uh, in his concluding remarks, says this. Make known to your brethren what has been decreed. Keep this most holy day according to the prescribed mode. We can thus celebrate this holy Easter day at the same time. If it is granted me as I desire to unite unite myself with you, we can rejoice together seeing that the divine power has made use of our instrumentality for destroying the evil designs of the devil and thus causing faith peace and unity to flourish among us. So peace, faith and unity to flourish based on untruth, based on lie, based on paganism. That's what it is. May God graciously protect you, my beloved brethren. That's the end of his his letter. And so the question, my dear friends, is who is the one who instituted Easter into the Christian world? Is it Jesus Christ himself? No. Are they the apostles who do it, did it? No. Was the original true church or the primitive church the one that instituted Easter into the Christian world? No. No, the answer is no, no and no. The one who instituted the paganism in the world, the pagan custom in the world, was Constantine the Great. And to conclude, the speaking of paganism, In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 8, the prophet Ezekiel was told by God to go and see what his kinsmen were doing as they rejected God himself, God of Israel, and turned to pagan customs. So the first thing that Ezekiel has seen was how in secret his kinsmen were worshipping all kinds of creepy things. Then God said, well, this is bad enough. But God then says to him, go and see, you're going to see even worse. What was worse were women weeping for Tammuz, the pagan sun god who they were weeping because he was dead and they were weeping so that they were hoping for his resurrection from death into life. And then after showing to Ezekiel all those pagan customs, God says then, He says to Ezekiel, well, now you're going to see the worst of all the customs. And then he shows Ezekiel the picture of those men whose backs were turned against the temple of God, temple of the true God, and with their faces, they were facing east, worshipping the sun as it was rising. Such custom is today found in various Catholic nations, who just by dawn, you know, gather and worship the sun rising on the east. So Easter, the sunrise, Easter worshiping the sun, that was the worst, the most detestable custom in God's eyes. Well, that is the truth, my dear friends. Easter was never part of the original Christianity. Easter was instituted by Constantine the Great, who basically presided over him, unbaptized, and a secular leader who presided over the the Council of Nicaea of 325. He imposed his own will on that council, not only when it comes to Easter, but when it comes to some other things. And then, because he was trying to unify his kingdom, his empire, uh, in order to repel those who kept the... Passover on the 14th of Abib, he sent after the Council of Nicaea, he sent that letter, you see that I've just read to you, letter to everyone who did not attend that council so that they will be informed that from now on there will be a uniform way of keeping so-called, uh, uh, so-called Passover, which is Easter. So, 
who imposed Easter onto the Christian world? Did the apostles do that? No. Did Jesus Christ, risen Jesus Christ, did, did, did he do it? No. It was Constantine, the supposed first Roman emperor, who imposed Easter onto the Christian world. So, if you follow that custom, whether you are aware or not, you basically follow the Christianity or the form of Christianity that was uh, invented by this pagan worshipper who to the end of to, till the end of his life never gave up his pagan title Pontifex Maximus meaning the uh, high priest of the pagan religion